Well, hello everybody, this is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to your Critique of the Week. It is Friday, September 23rd. So glad you could join me um, for a wonderful episode of the Critique of the Week, the best hour in poetry. It's going to be so fun. The purpose of the critique, as always, is to give that wonderfully valuable workshop experience to everybody, as many people as you can, for free, um, spread around the internet. Um, workshops are the best way, or one of the best ways to learn poetry. Um, you get to learn by sharing your own opinions. You get to see what people think about what strangers think about poems. Um, so that's always the goal. Share as much feedback and advice as you can as you go. In the chat windows, either on Facebook or YouTube, I always pass along as many as possible. But also, the poets are able to look at the, the chat windows, too, and see your comments um, as the, the day goes on. So um, please do leave as many thoughts as you have about the poems. We have a pair of uh, great poets today. we got Judith Fay. And uh, we have uh, B.L. Pike, uh, two poets who are regular viewers, actually, which is nice. They already told me how much they get out of the Critique of the Week um, and are very excited to be participating at their own, uh, um, have their own poems workshopped. So um, that's all just a regular show today. Let's dive in to see what these poems are that we have. Um, first up, we have uh, Judith Fay, and here's the first poem. State Street, Santa Barbara. And again, this is Judith Fay. State Street, Santa Barbara. Years later, they will return, prompted by the menacing threat of dark violence, where, snug in the safety of their clean white hotel room, they'll watch the image of a broken man with a swo swollen face beseech, why can't we all just get along? But not yet. Now, still ripe, they blink into the sun, stepping from the chic shop where she picked and he bought the perfect ring and perched on this bench. He takes her soft, warm hand, radiant with romance, a short-lived prayer, and asks her again to be his wife. Just as looking, or just as a long black limo rolls slow, a bouquet of ebullient teens bursting through the roof, fluttering her newly jeweled joy, she asks her memory to snap this picture, this moment, this serendipitous preamble to an inexorable, festering anger, anguish that she couldn't possibly, on that bench on State Street, imagine. That is the first poem, State Street, Santa Barbara. And um, let's see, as people come in, who we got here? We got Lisa Allison here and Kelly Rush. Joe Bark is here. Hello, Joe. Jenny Middleton, Katie Dozier's here. Sharon Fronte's here. Good to see you all. It took a while to um, load on Facebook for some reason, but we're good to go there. And then over on YouTube, we got D. Coleman, Karen Harvey, uh, Dick Westheimer's here, Nate Jacobs here, Cindy Gore, Clayton Clark, Diane Benitez, James Langford, Attractive Fahey. Good to see you all. Ethne's here, too. Good to see you, too. Okay. So um, State Street, Santa Barbara. Um, first of all, you know, it sets the scene. We had a nice, a nice title that functions, State Street, Santa Barbara. Years later, they will return prompted by the menacing threat of dark violence, where, snug in the safety of their clean white hotel room, they'll watch the image of a broken man with a swollen face beseech, why can't we all just get along? Um, but not yet. Yeah, so this is uh, referring to the Rodney King, I think the menacing threat of dark violence we're talking about. So so you kind of set the scene and, I think you kind of piece together that this is the, what year was that, 92? The Rodney King beating that was filmed, you know, and then the uh, subsequent. Um, and so so State Street Santa Barbara is like, what, two hours away from L.A. Um, so that's kind of the stage that's set. And I wonder if maybe, I don't know, how many people can, can piece that together? Is that something that, that most readers can piece together? Because I'm wondering if maybe we should add like an epigram to set it like just the year um so we know where we are in time or is that or is this enough details to where everybody would just obviously piece it together um so in general yeah dick westheimer has a similar thought as me love the movement in this it would be enhanced with fewer adjectives and stronger verbs yeah i agree too there's a little i mean things like um the menacing threat of dark violence is a very adjective rich type phrase like the adjectives are doing the work rather than the nouns it's not and, and you can see what happens with that like it's a um, it's an adjectified um, abstraction really um, like violence in general rather than showing what um, 
showing what's going on. So DebT can piece together the time, though. But I would wonder if some epigram would just make it smoother. Um, Sydney Gore has no problem with it. Um, but I wonder if we could set the stage a little bit more, um, either with a little longer title to let us know where we are, or the epigram. Because what, um, what's gained by making you have to... The, the thing you always have to wonder about is, if, if someone has to do work, um, like you want your reader to do work in a poem, but you want them to be doing emotional meaning-making work and not detail-oriented work. And so is it worth having to think about, oh, this is where we are, and this is like you know, having a map that Santa Barbara is this far away and, and how it might be tied into the, um, the riots that are going on in L.A.? Um, I don't know. Is that enough to, to justify like making readers think about it? Um, yeah, yeah, good, good point. So Dick Westheimer suggests this. Um, turning this, the, the beseech, the why can't we all just get along quote from Rodney King into the ep an epigram. Yeah, Dan Benitez votes for a date for clarity. I, do think, I just don't think it's worth making us piece that together, even though it's pretty clear. Um, and here, Alan Harvey didn't get the Rodney King reference either. So I think we should probably, I, I think, move this up to get the quote and the date up here. Like maybe, you know, this quote, Rodney King, what year was that? Was it 89 or 91? Um, yeah. So I think maybe get that up and so we know kind of where we are. And and then, and, and really this, hmm. So, I, and, and I think that, like the work of this first stanza is only, um, yeah. I mean, the work of the stanza is only to, to like set the stage. I don't know if we need that. Like the poem kind of picks up here. Um, like it could be summarized. Yeah, Sidney Gore though says too. Yeah, the quote needs to be with beaten face image. That's true. But but I think if you had this, um, you know, the, the, the idea of this menacing threat of dark violence um, is such an abstraction that we don't really engage with it. Um, but if if we were sit watching, however we actually were, um, you know, watching that happen on TV, I imagine, um, being in Santa Barbara, um, if we if we started with a quote and then we we jumped into the actual scene where we are and we just watch it happen, then we can get a more concrete way of describing that that violence that we're talking about, and get the face that. So we could just describe the TV screen once we get the quote. I think that's a better way to enter the poem. Um, so. And that's that's what I would do at the beginning. Um, but anyway, they'll watch just the image of a broken man with a swollen face beseech, why can't we all just get along? But not yet. Now, still ripe, so we're going back in time before 1990, whatever year that was. But not yet. Now, still ripe. <clears throat> um, where we go? Now, still ripe, they blink into the sun, stepping from the chic shop where she picked and he bought the perfect ring and perched on this bench. Um, now still ripe, they blink into the sun, stepping from the chic shop where she picked and he bought the perfect ring and perch on this bench. There's something about, even though the verb conjugation is right, there's something about the way that it's present and then the picked is past and then this is present again that makes it feel a little awkward. Um, and so I, I would do something like like a period here, and then make this um, um, like they perch on the bench, and then describe the perch a little bit, and then that that clears that up a little bit and doesn't um, and doesn't it doesn't make it, it's one of those things. There's some certain ways of phrasing things that feel like the verb tense shifted when it didn't, and that's one of those cases, and it throws you out of the poem a little bit. So I would I would cut that off, and then and then you can describe the bench a little bit. Because we'd like to see the scene a little more clearly, too. He takes her soft, warm hand, radiant with romance, a short-lived prayer. I I so this is where I start to like really enjoy the poem. Um, I like that sh the short-lived prayer of that. And he asks her again to be his wife. They're very nice. So, so as the scene starts to move and play out, like, like um, um, Dick Westheimer already, already mentioned the movement. And the movement's what really works well in this poem. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, so so people on, on Facebook, too, are saying, Judy Middleton and Joe Barca saying, I need an epigram. Yeah, I think we all would like a little more epigram. Yeah. Um, and then Kevin Lamaster pensions of tenses are off. Yeah, so definitely fix that tense, tense question, too. Um, like, we just, I, I feel like the, the poem it has a nice sense of movement, and this, 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 um, a really touching kind of simplicity to this part. We spend too much time piecing together what, what it means um, when we could, like just the, the timeline. Um, so, yeah. So anyway, he, he takes her soft, warm hand, radiant with romance, a short-lived prayer, and asks her again to be his wife, just as a long black limo slow ro- rolls slow, a bouquet of ebullient teens bursting through the sunroof. And it's a really well done image. I think somebody already pointed out how nice that image is, the bouquet of teens. Um, ebullient? Is that how you pronounce that? Ebullient or ebullient? Ebullient. It's one of those words that you hardly ever hear, but you see it in writing. Fluttering her newly jeweled joy, she asks her memory to snap this picture, this moment, this serendipitous preamble to, in a, to an inexorable... This is a tongue twister to me, too. An inexorable festering um, anguish. I don't even know what inexorable means. Inexorable. That's one of those words you kind of like see in in, in context. Um, for me, anyway. And I never know the exact... So impossible to stop or prevent is the... Di- you know, so it's... Um, I don't know. So this phrase feels clunky to me. The inexorable festering anguish. I would, I would you know, rephrase that to make it a little more poetic. Um, that she couldn't possibly, on that bench on State Street, imagine... And I, I like the ending too. So I like these sections. I like the movement here when we go into the scene of, um, um, you know, the the what is it like a like having a renewing your vows type thing? Because because it was um, and ask her again to be his wife, or is it the first time and she didn't say yes the first time? It raises some questions, and also against the backdrop of this, what is the? I think it was um, let's see. Um, yeah, somebody mentioned somewhere. Yeah, so it was Nate Jacob who says, I'm confused by the real reason for the first stanza's action. How does the threat of violence motivate the visit to the hotel? The two halves of the tension, Nellie Riot's first proposal, don't feel resolved enough. And yeah, that's the thing for me. So it feels like like this situation is a backdrop to this going on. Um, and... And maybe, I mean, I mean, I'd have to project what the the meaning of that is into the poem. So, so, I mean, is it that there was this this big historical event going on at the moment of the proposal, and so it's like, you know, they're wed together too in time and in memory, um, in the in the contrast of that, is that the point that the poem's making? Um, the festering anguish that she couldn't possibly on that bench on State Street imagine yeah so i'm not sure what the what the what the poem is telling us either um because of that contrast that nate jacob was pointing out of 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 what does this have to do with the rest and how are we what are we supposed to make of that it feels really it feels like this is a um a poem like one of those like like we all talk about how a poem is like some kind of unresolved itch that we have to scratch to make sense of you know or figure out what's going on some kind of problem that we don't really understand that we're trying to make sense of and make meaning from and it feels like this thing that the 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 strangeness of um the Rodney King situation going on at the same time is this like which is an awful thing and then at the same time this wonderful engagement thing is happening um, and that contrast seems to be like unsettled in the memory, and we're trying to like figure out what we feel about that. But I don't think we have yet. So I think this is like the beginning of a poem that needs to be pushed further. So, so what I would suggest, um, we already talked about getting the epigram up in here to just set the stage, so we don't have to piece together the actual timeline. Um, and then I, I would tell the story. Um, of, of being on that bench, which is really nicely done. Um, Kate Doge, Katie Dozier mentions. Um, that maybe taking out the ebullient or buoyant or however you'd say that. And I think I would agree. Cause I think it, she says that, um, what does she say that, it, that it, 
ruins the flow of an otherwise beautiful line or something like that. Distracts from the otherwise spectacular limit image that I love. Exactly. So I think maybe cutting that. But otherwise, this is really nice. So setting the stage for the, for the, the Rodney King situation in the timeline with an epigram to let us know what's going on at the same time. And then letting us know that at the same time this, this bench scene, which is really nice, is coming out. But then the, the poem isn't resolved. Like, push it farther into what this really means and try to figure out and mine like, what your unconscious is trying to tell you about how you feel about this situation. I don't think we've gotten to that point yet. So it's like a, you know, it's like a half-done poem that needs to be pushed further, in my opinion. Um, let me see what other... Yeah, Kelly Rush says it feels like the poem is trying to shoehorn a news event into the scene. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I, I think it really, I think it is significant on an emotional level. I can feel that, but I don't think it's resolved as to why. We haven't, that, like, that's the real, like, every poem is asking itself, why do I exist? You know, I think that's really what, what a poem is doing. It's saying, like, why do I need to exist? And the 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 answer why is to resolve this this emotion of that event happening at the same time as the proposal's happening. Um, but that hasn't been explored, really. It's sort of been set up, and we're waiting to push it farther into um, into it. So, um, yeah. Yeah, Nate Jacob, again, there's awesome potential here. As, is this a mixed-race marriage proposal? Are these people former participants in the riot? I need to know way more for me to connect to the tension, which is barely played up. But rest assured, I want more. Yeah, exactly. I, like, we just want more, I think, from this poem. Um, Kelly Rush says, I like she asked her memory to snap this picture. And I did love that line, too. Where was that? Because um, that is something we do that we don't, you don't see people mention very often in poems. Or, you know, just like, I want to save this moment in my mind oh, right here. Yeah, that was a really nice line, too. So, um, so great setup of this poem and a lot of potential. Um, but, it, but I think it's like half written. I think it needs to be pushed farther into the emotions of what that contrast in events means to you personally. Um, um, Jenny Middleton says, is the poem partially about a loss of innocence when a place known in the past is revisited as change and has different associations that are painful and unresolved? Yeah. And Kevin Lamaster says, uh, it's almost like we are wrapping it in a newspaper article. Yeah. And Joe Barker, could the author refine the juxtaposition? So I think we just want to push this farther. Um, yeah. I think that's just the general thing with this poem. Let me see if there's other comments I missed on YouTube. Um, um, so Deb T said, I was thinking it was the location that wedded together the engagement and the beating, but maybe not. Yeah, I mean, that was on a freeway in Los Angeles, which is two hours-ish away. Um, Diane Bija says, I thought for a moment that the long black limo was a hearse. And then Jim Lang Langford points out that he asked her again. And yeah, this is the thing. I, I tripped over this mentally, too, because that's not resolved, um, what that actually means. Um, like... Like, did did he ask before and she said no? Or or is this like a renewing your vows type event? Did they go back to the same place of the original proposal to redo it again um, later? Like, what is the again? I don't, I don't think that's clear either. Um, but you can feel like the meaning that's underneath this poem. And that's why we want more. Like, we want to we wanna figure this thing out and, and feel how it all connects together because I think it does. So... Um, so, so push this poem, you know, give us more, give us more of the backstory um, and, and, and more of the, the emotion and, and how the events tie together. Um, Deborah Martin says, perhaps the anguish to come connects to the Rodney King event. Yeah, or I mean, or is it both? Is it like the, the marriage didn't go that well? And, and so that's the anguish? Or is it the Rodney King event? Yeah, we just don't know. So... So push this poem farther. Um, and Nate Jacob points out too, the short-lived prayer um, doesn't really, um, what's he say? The short-lived prayer also lacks meaning for the rest of the poem. It is like, like there, 
there's a science that there's more underneath the surface that we haven't haven't talked about and, and haven't explored because um, those lines resonated with me i felt I felt the meaning and the and the significance beneath them. I just don't think that we got to to learn what that significance and meaning was um, okay, so that is the first one State Street Santa Barbara a lot to work with here um, I'd love to see the the revision eventually when as we push it farther and learn and explore more of this uh, situation. Now let's do my soap, my soap, and again, this is the poems by Judith Fay this week. Uh, we're also doing poems later by B.L. Pike. But here's My Soap by Judith Fay. My Soap. A bar of perfumed soap infused with my favorite scent. It came in a box embossed with gold and went in my underwear drawer. But when I reached for my panties one day, it said, Why, What am I doing here? I belong near the water. Yes, I agreed and, I, and moved it there. I loved its breath. Ladies who could wear silk dresses and never get wet spots under their arms, who never had to pay for a drink, whose shoes never hurt, whose slips never showed. My soap watched me shower. I didn't touch it. The plastic wrap began to bubble and crack. My soap was turning to slime. Unwrap me, goddammit. What's the matter with you? I just want to keep you forever, I told my slimy bar. But I peeled off the wrapper and slid the bar over my skin. Ah, sighed my soap. This is where I belong. It sits still on the edge of the tub, ruffled and shrunken. It looks like a bone, the bone of a woman who never knew how to use beauty to clean herself free. So that's very interesting. So this, the um, um, personification of the soap and wondering what it, you know, what it's thinking is a very compelling, I, I like that aspect of it. So my soap. And again, I think the, the, the title, it's a functional title again, um, doesn't add an extra layer like it's not like an extra level like it could be but um but very clever and fun poem yeah yeah joe barker says very clever um Cindy, kimberly mcneil says brava yeah um yeah um so my soap so i so said maybe the title could be more interesting but it functions it's not a bad title um A bar, I mean, you could even, you know, this could be, the first line could be a better title even. A bar of perfumed soap infused with my favorite scent. It came in a box embossed with gold and went in my underwear drawer. I like the, the rhyme here of scent and went for some reason. It really stands out in a nice internal rhyming way. And and I love the um, the 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 sort of, I don't know, the mixing of business with pleasure or something that, the um the contrast of this this thing and then you just, it's stuffed in an underwear drawer and and it's turned on that rhyme which is interesting too like it's almost there's a humorous kind of way that that turns which is nice um but when I reached for my panties one day it said what am I doing here I belong near the water yes I agreed and moved it there um so so really I, it's a it's a funny it's a nice setup though I like it. Yes, I agreed and moved it there. I loved its breath. Ladies who could wear silk dresses and never get wet spots under their arms. Um, yeah, so Deb T says, yeah, agree. Clever, fun, good images. Um, Cindy Gore says imaginative, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, clever is the word too. Joe Barker used the word clever as well. Um, Um, Joe Bugger says, danced on the edge of the sen of sensual and then veered away. Clever. Yeah, everyone's saying clever. Everyone's enjoying this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sharon Friday says, I reach for my panties might be a fun title. That would. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Um, there, there's something I wanted to. I guess maybe we'll do line level stuff right now. But there's, um, you know, missing punctuation. Which is always, it's tricky because you, you, can, you can make choices, I think, about how much punctuation you want to use. That's one of the things we look at, you know, as I'm copy editing poems before we go to publication, um, I, I'm looking at it, is the use of, of punctuation, and is the style consistent? And, um, and if, it's, if, you, if you're really loose with punctuation and don't use it very often, and that's just the style, or if there's no punctuation at all and that's the style... Um, then I just let them go because you kind of learn what the poem what the poem is doing on that level just as you go and as long as it's consistent it doesn't really throw you off as long as it doesn't create confusion 
Um, but if a poem is following all the rules, which mostly in this poem it is until it's not, then that ends up kind of throwing people out of the poem a little bit. So, um, so a bar of perfume soap infused with my favorite scent. You need some kind of punctuation, a dash or something there, um, or a period, and then capitalize the next line, um, or, a, or a semicolon. Um, it came in a box embossed with gold and went in my underwear drawer. Um, but when I reached for my panties one day, it said, what am I doing here? I belong near water. Yeah, that's funny. I like that. I could actually spoke. Um, yes, I agreed and moved it there. I love the simplicity of that. Like, you know, the, the, the surrealness of the, the soap speaking to you is just completely accepted, which is what makes it kind of fun. Um, and then I just the simplicity of, yes, I agreed and moved it there. There's a really nice, nice, again, it's like a, a similar turn to here where it, um, the, the straightness of it plays up the, the, the cleverness and the humor of it. I loved its breath. Ladies who could wear silk dresses and never get wet spots out of their arms. So here for this, I'd probably commas and then not capitalize these. Who never had to pay for a drink, whose shoes never hurt. So I would, I would just commas just to, because we're mostly using regular punctuation. Um, and then, and then lowercase all these. Um, my soap watched me shower. I didn't touch it. Again, the soap watching you shower. Yeah. And then, yeah, this is what I was getting to, Nate, that, that this is a playful to a point, but there are some heavier points to it, which are poignant at the very least. I felt some real loneliness in, the, in that shower. Yeah, that, that's what holds you. Like the, the cleverness and the, and the funness of, of personifying the soap um, um, it sort of draws you into the poem and then leaves you open to the feelings, uh, the deeper feelings that are underneath it, which is a kind of loneliness and like a, a desire for something more. Um, and my soap watched me shower. I didn't touch it. There's really, I mean, you can see some really good storytelling here in the, in the simplicity and the directness of this. Like we're just telling us what happened without adding any flowery stuff on top. There's no like a bunch of adjectives like there were in that, in the beginning of the first poem that we talked about. Um, just very simple and direct. And that's really compelling, um, to write that way where you're, when you're telling a story. Um, so I didn't touch it. The plastic wrap began to bubble and crack. My soap was turning to slime. <laughs> Unwrap me, God damn it! What's the matter with you? And that's funny. I mean, you know, the the soap sitting there stuck in its its um its wrapping. Um, I just want to keep you forever. I told my slimy bar, but I peeled off the wrapper. I wonder. I mean, these two lines are are longer. I wonder why not just break them there. Um, you know, break those two and just pull them in to make the poem a little more clean. Um. I told my slimy bar, but I peeled off the wrapper and slid the bar over my skin. Ah, sighed my soap. This is where I belong. It sits still on the edge of, my, of the tub, ruffled and shrunken. It looks like a bone. And again, this is the turn to the more serious stuff. And we've set up with, with the humor and the playfulness of it, we've set up a, a space where we can talk about seriousness without it being too heavy. Um, and, and also the contrast of the playfulness to the, the more poignant aspect of it makes the, the, the end stand out a lot. So I think it's a really nice setup, too, for a poem. It sits still on the edge of the tub, ruffled and shrunken. It looks like a bone. And again, I think there needs some punctuation here. The bone of a woman who never knew how to use beauty to clean herself free. Hmm. Yeah, a very nice ending, too. So I think this is a poem that just needs to be cleaned up a little bit. I wonder if the clean herself free is a little too kind of like on the nose, like too direct. Um, is there a better way we could phrase that last line? It's not a last line. I think if we were if we were talking about it, like in an editorial meeting, just considering whether to publish it, probably it might come down to, I mean, if there were some, some things cleaned up a little bit up here, um, the, the fact that the, the last line doesn't really hit home um, as well as it seems like it could. Um, so yeah, Joe Barker says, yes, tweak the last line. Um, I think that, that the, the only thing that's really missing from this poem other than small edits, maybe a better title is, um, is, is that last line I think could be said better. The bone of a woman who never knew how to use beauty to clean herself free. How, what else, what is it trying to get at there? Um, 
I don't know. There just seems like a way that that could be phrased because the bone of the, I mean, these are such great lines, uh, which I didn't say, I guess, because someone else mentioned them already. But man, the, the ruffled and shrunken, it looks like a bone. Like what a thing to notice. And then the bone of a woman who never knew how to use beauty. Um, and that's just great. The, the transition to the repetition of bone. Like we talk about um, not using the same word close often. And this is an example of where you do. And it's great when you, it's with this effect because it's modifying your, your experience of the bone by making it like a bone. But then, no, it's not even just a bone. It's the bone of a woman. And not only that, but the bone of a woman who never knew how to use beauty to do something. I think if we just figure out this. Um, even if it was just the bone of a woman who never knew how to use beauty to make herself free instead of clean, um, maybe it's just that word that feels off. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, some, yeah, maybe that's it. I just think there could be a better last line. And I think the poem would click home if we found it. So one of the things that, that I think it's fun to do you know, once you get the, you know, the smaller revisions that we're talking about up here is to type out the poem or at least this section maybe, or write it out depending on how, however you write. If you write by hand, just write it out, but write out those last lines. Um, you know, do the, the, it looks like a bone, the bone of a woman who never knew how to use beauty. And then just spontaneously say what that last line might be. So if, if it were me, I would be typing that out and then just sort of trying to get into a, a, like a subconscious where I'm not really thinking about what I'm going to say and then letting whatever come out and then iterate that, do that several times um, over and over again and see what comes up in the same way that, that, that wonderful exercise we keep talking about now that um, for the titles that, um, that Kim Stafford had, where you generate several different titles and see which one works, generate several different last lines here. And that's, and then I think the real last line that you want will come out and it will announce itself when it does. So that's what I would do to, to get the, that last line. Um, yeah. Yeah, so Jenny Middleton says, I think there's a sense of saving the soap for something special and never, never gets used. Perhaps like a life that isn't used is implied in the last line. Yeah, that's a great way to put it, Jenny, yeah. And Lisa Allison says, can you cut the last line and end on beauty? And I was wondering that too. Um, so let's read it like that. So if we had this, ah, sighed my soap, this is where I belong. It sits still on the edge of the tub, ruffled and shrunken. It looks like a bone, the bone of a woman who never knew how to use beauty. Could we end like that? That's another thing to consider too. Maybe it could. Hmm. And Sharon Friday says to open her own scent, maybe for the ending. Hmm. I'll go back to YouTube. And Clayton Clark says, I like the moment she says, I just want to keep you forever. I feel the loneliness there. Yeah, for sure. Um, Kim Vaughn suggests um, dropping free. So we can maybe just cut that. Um, the bone of a woman who never knew how to... You, how to use beauty to clean herself. That, that's a possibility too. Hmm. I don't know. There's just play with that line and, and see what, what works, I think. Um, I think so. Um, one thing that I, I gloss over, Jim, James Langford points out, sometimes she used quotes and sometimes not. Please let us know the right way, Tim. And this, so this is a, um, if I, if I interpret it right, right, when she used quotes, it's her own speech. And when the soap speaks, it's italicized, which, which suggests that it's like an internal, to me, it suggests like it's an internal dialogue. I remember, I think um, that, that's the convention that Stephen King always uses. It's been like decades since I read, but I, you know, at one point as a teenager, I read every Stephen King book. And I think that that's what he does. So if it's an internal dialogue, if it's what someone's thoughts are, I think Stephen King italicizes it, but if it's um, if it's uh, actually spoken out loud in the story, then it would be in quotes, and that's the difference. And I, I think for a long time I thought that was the way that was just like the convention of how to do it, but then eventually I realized I think that it, it, it might just be Stephen King and people influenced by him that um, do it that way. But that's how I got it. Um, that's the sense I got out of this. 
um, was that since it's the soap talking, um, it's italicized because it's not really being heard. Like, like, you know, molecules of air aren't actually vibrating with those words, but I just want to keep you forever actually is. Um, and so that's what, um, that's what I think, but very much like the punctuation, um, it really is just a, just a punctuation. It's just a, a formatting style. As long as you're consistent, I think, and we don't we aren't confused. You can use whatever style you want. So some people italicize, um, some people use quotes. Um, you could do whatever you want as long as it's sort of we can figure out what you're doing, and we don't have to like think too much about what you're doing. Um, yeah. There is though the the yes I agreed. Um, is that spoken? Maybe, maybe put quotes around that too, but, but I think I would maybe, if you're, if anyone's worried about the, the yes part, and if that might be speech, you could cut the yes and just the agreed is a um, paraphrase of what was said or thought. And then you don't have that question of whether to italicize it or not. And then you can leave the, um, the italics for the bar of soaps speech, um, Let's see. Yeah, and Deborah, she says, the combination of lightness with the weightier stuff underneath works for me. The Quest Timer says, I love so much of this. The glib conversation takes me out of what has become or some real weight here, the comparisons with those other ladies. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, well, I I don't know. I don't have a problem with that because I think, you know, the so, the soap reminds her of this. Like or the soap reminds her of the person she isn't, um, and 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 it's the scent of it that that brings that feeling. Like this is the soap that somebody like this deserves, and so it smells like that. I think that I thought that was great. I really like this section actually, um, and I think it's a really good poem. Just a little bit of cleaning up and a better last line, and it's good to go. Um, let's see. Am I still um, live on YouTube? Someone on YouTube, tell me if I'm live. Because the thing is spinning and it says I only have seven viewers all of a sudden. Even though the other spot, it says I have uh, I have 17 or 29. So anyway, I don't know. Um, yeah. So if somebody let me know if I'm not on YouTube. But I don't know if there's anything I can do with it right now anyway. Um, but yeah, so good poem. Let's move on. YouTube is frozen for me. Hmm. Yeah, there's nothing on my end that would do that. So um, yeah, YouTube viewers are just dropping off. Which is not good. <laughs> because... Okay, restart it. Yeah. It must just be a YouTube thing. Let's see. Well, I refreshed the page for me. I wonder how much YouTube got. We might have to post. I might have to pull the, the Facebook video and post it later. If, if, it, if YouTube actually cut off or cut out and it wasn't even being recorded on YouTube, I will do that so people can, can have it. Um, I probably should record these locally too. Oh, it froze again. Yeah. Yeah, YouTube could be having any kind of issues. Well, uh, go over to, I mean, <laughs> go over to Facebook, I guess. It's a good thing we have a backup stream on Facebook and Twitter. Um, yeah, YouTube. I might have to re, yeah, download it from Facebook and upload it from YouTube. Okay. Well, anyway, let's continue. And let's pretend that's not happening, unfortunately. Because um, there's nothing on my end that would, everything's perfect here. So it must be a YouTube problem. Which is unfortunate. It says I have an excellent connection. But it's just spinning. Refresh. Hmm. But we'll see. It could be being recorded. Hmm. Well. Yeah. That's usually... Uh, Usually YouTube doesn't have problems, and Facebook's the problem. Yeah, here, I'll, I'll tell people. Um, 
Um, and then I'll see if I can put a link. Can I do a link? Where would a link be? To this. I have no idea how to get a link. YouTube is so much better than Facebook. I don't like Facebook at any level, honestly. You can also go to Twitter. Um, yeah, we're streaming fine on Twitter, too. So, Or maybe... Yeah, we're streaming fine on Twitter. So, um, yeah. So, um, yeah, you can go to Facebook. But, but, no, but the people who can't... Yeah. The people who can't uh, hear me on YouTube are... Um, Yeah, so Twitter works too, um, and Facebook works. Ah, thanks. So Julian Matthews included the Facebook link, which I couldn't find. Um, so now I, uh, so then I have Facebook links in the chat. So anyway, yeah, YouTube must be having problems. Probably some kind of network outage at YouTube, which is fortunately rare because YouTube is so great. Anyway, that was a lot of um, <laughs> a lot of uh, a lot of wasted time. B. L. Pike. The global mustard shortage looms ahead of summer barbecues, which sounds like a news headline, but very fun news headline too. Um, this is gonna—we're gonna look at two poems by B.L. Pike. They're pretty short. Um, but I, first of all, I just love the title: "Global Mustard Shortage Looms Ahead of Summer Barbecues." Let's see how this poem goes. We're short of everything these days: grace, for instance, reason, joy, and now it's mustard. Smooth or grainy, Cajun style, dilled, neon yellow, brown, and gray poupon. We used to slap it freely on most anything. Burgers, dogs, our griefs and grievances, the brutal constant pain of our discordance. Or was that all some other self we used to slather? I don't remember anymore. They say long COVID brings its own confusion. So do long wars, long politics, the long and short of everything. The summer barbecues, our longings, all our shortages. Very interesting. Yeah, very quick poem. Great. I mean, the title just opens it right up. I mean, the title does so much work. Um, Joe Becker says great line breaks. Um, let's see. Yeah. <laughs> Nate Jacobs says good great poem. Give me hot dog. Yeah, I, I, yeah. So, so that the so you can see how much, um, how much a good title like we had in the other poems, we had just simple titles: State Street, Santa Barbara, which were functional. You know, they they did work. And the other one was My Soap. But you can see how a title, you know, if you if you were looking through a table of contents, you saw this title, you would want to read this poem, and and because it's an interesting title, and and it might just be a news headline that that we saw, you know, that the author saw. And wrote down, and that became the title because it's such a funny headline, uh, and that you know, it's what inspired the poem. That's what how I'm imagining it, that it worked. But the, just reading the title makes me want to read the whole poem because it's so fun. Global mustard shortage looms ahead of summer barbecues. Um, we're short of everything these days. Grace, and again, we're having the same uh, punctuation issues where it's not consistent, um, and so uh, maybe a dash there, an M dash. We're short of everything these days, grace, for instance, reason, joy, and now it's mustard. Smooth or grainy, Cajun style, dilled. I mean, again, here, you know, because we have punctuation, so if we had no comma here, and if we, if we dropped all the commas from the end of lines, then we, could not, we wouldn't have to have a comma here. Um, but because we're not, we expect commas to be, you know, so it's just a matter of consistency. And we expect commas, because um, it's not dill neon yellow, it's dill neon yellow, like a separate thing. Um, so I think you need a comma there. Brown, the great Poupon, we used to slap on, it on uh, the great Poupon, we used to slap it for the on. Again, that's a transition, so we need a dash. Um, most, on most anything, Burgers, dogs, our griefs and grievances, the brutal constant pain of our discordance, or was that all some other self we used to slather? Um, yeah. I mean, all the, the slapping on, the self, the slather, very great sounds there, too. I don't remember anymore. They say long COVID brings down its own confusion. So do wars. Long wars, long politics, the long and short of everything. Our summer barbecues, our longings, all our shortages. 
Yeah. And so Richard Westheimer points this out, and, and this is really an issue. The, the capitalizing first words diminishes the options for using line breaks and punctuation as cadence devices. Yeah. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, so there's just really this is a, just a really nice poem, and, and Joe Barker says just publish it, Tim. <laughs> um, um, I mean, Gordon says a guideline for when to use a comma versus a dash. Um, I don't. It's just your own style and preference, but but the the key. I mean, it has to be consistent, or else we get confused. Um, and so, yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, Sarah Horn says, I think it must be Microsoft Word capitalizing every line. I think you can turn that function off. I don't think so. I, I mean, it's a convention that some people prefer. And what it does, I mean, we, we haven't talked about this in a while, but what it does to capitalize the first letter of each line, it's an older tradition of doing that. Uh, more formal poems tend to do that. And it, it, it provides a sense that each line has its own gravity and like heightens that line. It heightens the, the, the use of line and maybe adds more tension to when there are line breaks too. Um. Yeah. So Sharon Friday says many ca poets capitalize each word. I don't know why, a and that's why. It's because it ma it sort of reminds you and makes it feel like the weight of each line is its own unit, and it makes that stand out more. Um. And we, we talk a lot uh, sometimes about how um you know the the length of the line um is sort of a way to pace your reading of the poem, and the use of line breaks also can either heighten or or de-emphasize the, the effect of line, how a poet like James Tate will have long lines ending on articles whenever he wants, and, and it makes it so it feels like you don't have a really strong line, and it lets you, it sort of lets your mind engage with a visual that it's creating a little more. It makes it a little more, more cinematic or novelistic versus the focus on the language. And so when you have the capitalize the first line, it does the opposite of like a James Tate poem where it emphasizes the existence of each line as its own unit. And then that makes it, it heightens the language a little bit. It makes you read a little more slowly. It makes you have sort of more gravitas in the way it's read. And so that's why people do it, but it's becoming less and less common. And so, um, <laughs> so Katie Dozier says, I find it jarring, which creates a pun in this sense. Um, and um, yeah, Joe Barker says, if you're going to use and jam it, maybe don't use caps. Um, yeah, and so so you get you, I, there's a lot, there's more resistance to it than there used to be, I think. Um, yeah, Nate Jacob says, just to talk about more general things though. So, but just to finish up the punctuation, I think just having it be consistent is is a little bit lacking here. Um, and I don't mind any. I mean, personally, I don't mind any. Um, style decisions you make as long as they're consistent. The thing that I don't like is when they're not consistent because then you wonder, you're, you're forced to say like, is this intentional or is this just a mistake? And, and then in certain things like, is it dilled neon yellow? No, it's dilled neon yellow. Those are two separate things in the list. And so that, that detracts from the poem if it's not consistent and clear. Um, but if it, if it were written in a way that you didn't have line, you know, it, it was clear that um, you don't have commas at the end of lines and the lines are standing out that much, then you, you would just know automatically that dild is separate from neon yellow. And so it's really all about consistency with this kind of formatting stuff. Um, as, as far as I'm concerned, as long as it's consistent, it's fine. And, and as long as it doesn't create confusion, it's fine. So, um, yeah. Um. But anyway, so talking about more general things, though, um, Nate Jacobs says, I like this. It's a great play, but the force behind the metaphor comes up um, a little bit weak for me. The end could stand a shot of spicy brown, maybe even move some wasabi, if you will. Um, and, and yeah, so so this is what my opinion would be at reading this submission. This is how I would go through it. So I would be, if this was came in, I would think, oh, really cool title. And then we're short of everything these days. It's a great start. Uh, Grace, for instance, that's just brilliant. I love that line break um, and, and where it goes. Because you don't think it's going to be something like that. And then it is. And we are. And man, that's true. Grace, for instance, reason, joy, and now it's mustard. That transition, I mean, it's, it's just a wonderful opening stanza. So at this point, I'm thinking maybe we publish it. Smoother, grainy, Cajun-style, dilled. 
um, neon yellow, brown. And here I'm like, well, we got to fix that punctuation, but that's fine. That's no big deal when you're reading a submission. That gray poupon, we used to slap it freely on. And then it's the, the gray poupon, freely on, a really nice little rhyme there that's kind of subtle, um, and especially with a big enjambment. So you don't have to hang on that on. It's not an end stop. It's on most anything. Um, burgers, dogs, our griefs and grievances. And again, the concrete versus the abstract is a really nice way to use lists here. The brutal, constant pain of our discordance. Again, that's a nice phrase. Um, it's an it's a abstract. You know, discordance is an abstraction, but it's a one that's done really well because it has concrete stuff around it. So I'm enjoying the poem all the way through to this point. Or was that some other salve we used to slather? I don't remember anymore. And then, so I'm still liking the poem up to here. The I don't remember remember anymore is a nice, you know, simple statement that has a lot of power to it. There's a lot of weight behind that. They say long COVID brings its own confusion. So when I get to long COVID, and it's an unfortunate truth, but there's so many COVID poems. Like the, um, the, um, the, the Rattle Chapbook Prize, I mean, we have so many submissions that are like the COVID diaries, you know, and it's like 20% of submissions are about COVID and it, you know, it just gets to be much. And so when I get to the COVID, it takes me out of the poem or it just, it, it just loses a little bit of its um, specialness because it blends in with all the other COVID poems. Cause everybody, you know, went through this, we had this big mass experience together. Um, and so there's so many poems about it. Um, and then having another poem about it is something that, you know, it has, it's like after 9-11 was the same way, if, if anybody was still alive back then. Um, but like, we just got so many poems about 9-11 that eventually it was like, well, it has to be a really good 9-11 poem to keep going um, because there are just so many and you can't have the same topic over and over again. And so I, to me, bringing up COVID, even though it's related with the, you know, the supply chain stuff we're talking about, the shortages and the, and the, and the response, um, detracts a little bit from the poem for me, honestly. So, so I would consider getting rid of that and let it be a more general thing and not precisely about COVID. Um, you know, like you could, like if this were just illnesses or something, or um, I think that would work better if it wasn't specific, if it, if it was allowed to be a little more general. So do long wars, long politics. I mean, there is a riff off the long COVID though, which is really nice. So... And maybe it just is what it is, and, and it's worth it anyway. But that's something that, that sort of dings the poem for me. Long COVID brings its own confusion. And again, I think we need some kind of punctuation there. So do long wars, long politics, probably a dash. So do long wars, long politics, the long and short of everything. We got that three, um, that rule of three going. So we love it. Our minds love a three list thing, three repetitions. And, and it shifts every time, too, like long wars, long politics, the long and short of everything. The way that that list operates and that the end is a different f- syntactic formation is just it's wonderful. Um, our summer barbecues, our longings. And I think maybe that is too much. Now we just end there. Um, because all our shortages, it, it's just better. If it's, it's better if, it, if it's left a little bit more unsaid, I would say. Um yeah. Kevin the Master says, I feel it abruptly stopped. I want a little more. Yeah, that's a possibility too. The long and short of everything, our summer barbecues, our longings, all our shortages. I mean, I think all our shortages is just a little too clean. That's why, you know, because it just goes right back up to the short, you know, it's just such a such a clean turnaround. Um but maybe, I don't know. Yeah, so Annie Wilcox says, love the play between the concrete and abstract. Um, Nate Jacobs says, I think the responses to these things are the mustards. I want a bigger realization, some resolve at the end for me to relate to. Um, Katie Dozier, I feel like it works as a metaphor because of abstractions that extend the meaning. Yeah. Sharon Franti says maybe ended at I don't remember anymore. I wonder if that would be enough. Um, hmm. 
I don't know. I mean, really, the poem has so much potential for me here. There's such a feeling behind it, and, and it's such a clean way that it's written. There's a really wonderful way that it's written. Um, and, and then the end just doesn't... I mean, I like the the way that it's written um, at the end, but it doesn't have... I, I feel like, you know, what Nate Nate's mentioning it missing at the end. I think maybe this is just a missed turn, you know? And, and maybe I don't remember anymore could be the end. Or maybe what we need is like some kind of completely different change you know um you know or is that all some other self we used to slather i don't remember anymore and then shift completely to a different scene or like i you know what what else you know you're at a party i assume right we're are we at a party i imagine we're kind of at a summer barbecue but maybe we can like more specifically be at a summer barbecue and you can look up and see something um, some sense of like transition and movement here that's different from this, which is kind of a continuation of what we've already talked about. Um, so maybe even though this is well written and it came out in a nice way, uh, maybe this is just a false turn and we just need to, you know, take a different door or open a window or go, just go somewhere a little different to, to seal the poem home. Um, so Laurel Benjamin says, I don't like to think a COVID poem would only be accepted to COVID journals. What would make this work if one does mention it? Yeah, it, it's just, it becomes a thing where there's so many poems about it that it's, it's got to be special. Like, like for 9-11 is just a better example. There was just, oh, it was a funny experience, but over and over again, we're like, oh, well, this is the last 9-11 poem we're going to publish. And then a couple months later, you get another one and it would be, it would be amazing and do something different and unusual and just well I, this is the last 9-11 poem we'll publish and then you think maybe it was and a year later there's another one you know and that's kind of the feel of covid at this point where it really has to stand out in order to you know it just has to be special because it, there's so much so much other covid poems that it's coming up with um so so that's the thing um, and you'd be saying like, it's, it's not that you can't publish a poem about COVID anymore. It's that like, is it doing enough? Is it doing something different? Is it making, um, yeah. Is it, is it making, is it something like magical and different that I never thought of? And it's harder and harder to do that is really the issue. Cause there's so many poems about it. Um, uh, yeah, Richard Westheimer says, false door, best craft poetry nugget of the day. Yeah, and so yeah, we do. And in, in poems, we talk about, like, if there's a door, you can take it and move to a different room of the poem. And, and yeah, and this is, calling this a false door, which I don't know if anyone is, did you just make that up, Dick? I don't know. But that's a great way to think of it, is, um, you know, sometimes you take a door and it's not the room you want. But, and he wrote the, that room anyway, so you kind of leave it in your poem. And, and you might love that room, but it just didn't didn't really get to the heart of what you wanted to say. And I think maybe that's what happened here. So maybe some kind of other door. Like, look look in this room and see what other door there is besides this door to take. And then take that and see how it goes. Oh, Richard. Uh, Dick says, no, I did. Okay, I guess. Did I say false door? That's great, though. Yeah. I guess I'm brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. Um, let's see. Okay, well, let's move on to the other poem, too. Um, but yeah, so this just the ending is the only thing stuff. I love everything else. Ending and a little bit of punctuation tweaking, but good stuff. Let's look at the other poem by uh, B. L. Pike again. It says Armenia is only her stage name. In their own language, Armenians call their country Hayastan. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, and again, another really fascinating title. Like if you saw this in the table of contents, so so B. L. Pike is great at, at making titles. We've established this because this is a great one too. If I saw this in the table of contents, I'd want to read that poem. Armenia is only her stage name. And it's the her too. It's the personification of that, which sort of makes it feel like it's acting on two levels at the same time. And then we get this epigram, which explains, like if the whole poem explained this, it might be enough to be a poem, but she puts this in an epigram. Um, in their own language, Armenians call their country Hayastan. So, um, so interesting fact. So I, I'm really super engaged, right? Without even reading any of the content of the poems yet. Yeah. Nate Jacobs says amazing titles. Yeah. <laughs> Sharon Friendy says, I would not put COVID in this mustard. <laughs> That's funny. Um, okay. 
Right back out of this poem. So, so I love the start. Let's see how, where it goes. Ancient Hyastan balances between hostile neighbors, a funambulist threading the gravity on either side of her thin, taut wire. Landlocked, she once knew the brisk breath of the sea, even the drenched arrival of an ark teetering atop her secret mountain, Ararat. Diminished now, but unwavering, she steps lightly on sylph-like, brandishing for stability her parasol of history cherished. The music that accompanies her performance wails the years of pain and conquest, of genocide, exile, and diaspora. But never mind, she long ago mastered the arts of grace and purpose and endurance, of balancing her longings with strategic silence. Very interesting poem. That that personification of the... Um, what is a funambulist? Is that is that a tightrope walker? That's what I imagine, but I, I'm not. I think I've seen that word once in my life. Um, yeah, a tightrope walker. Okay, so um, funambulist. That's interesting. Like, would enough people know that word, or at least within context, or do you have trouble with that? Because if there's a word that's so unusual, let this happens a lot with um. Um, like phobias, because there's so many weird phobias. A lot of times people will submit poems that have a weird phobia mentioned, and I have no idea what the phobia is. It's not just, you know, everybody knows like the arachnophobia or the, um, maybe even the, you know, a few others, um, nyctophobia and things like that, fear of the night. But, um, but, but there's really obscure, strange phobias. And, um, and, and the, when those are in, you have to stop the poem and be like, well, what, which phobia is that? And actually look it up. And that kind of throws you out. So is funambulist a word that's like that? Or does everybody, is it is a word that, yeah. Um, um, let's see. Um, yeah, this fabulous title, um, um, Joe Barker asks if B.L. Pike has a collection. Yeah, I mean, it's great poems here. I should, um, you just mentioned they're just great descriptions of things. Great, great use of concrete language in these poems. Um, so let's see, Kevin, uh, Lamaster said I wouldn't have a problem looking up for the beauty of this poem. That's a good point, too. I mean, the poem makes you want to, makes you feel fine looking stuff up, um, Nate Jacobs says the tightrope walking deserves a bit more play in this poem. Extend the metaphor. Is Hyastan the walker or the wire? Clarify. Joe Parker says go with tightrope. Um, yeah. I mean, could you just say ancient Hyastan balances between hostile neighbors, a tightrope walker threading the gravity on either side of her thin, taut wire? Do you lose anything? I don't think you lose anything by saying tightrope walker. Um, you know, the, the music is there. It's a, it's a vivid enough image. We don't talk about tightrope walkers all that much. Um, so I think maybe I just, just use the tightrope walker, it, the, the, just pop it in and it feels fine. The music of it feels fine. So I would probably, probably just say tightrope walker there. Um, but, but great, great images too. The threading, it's not just a tightrope walker on a wire. It's a tightrope walker threading the gravity on either side of her thin taut wire. Um, and that's just the difference between using really strong, concrete language versus using abstraction or not going deep enough into the, the language. Um, the fact that it's threading the gravity on either side of her. Like, what a description that is. That's amazing. <laughs> like, really, that's really good. Um, and, and, and how much, like, that brings the poem to life. Um, yeah. Um, landlocked. She once knew the brisk breath of the sea. Again, brisk breath of the sea. Like, that's what concrete language does. It, like, like it's, it's living language when the language is concrete like that. Um, so just a great example of how to make your poems feel alive. Um, landlocked, she once knew the brisk breath of the sea, even the drenched arrival of an ark teetering atop. And then the teetering goes back to the tightrope, too. It just sort of harkens back to that sense, teetering atop a sacred mountain. Um an era rat. Um, I wonder if I did wonder if maybe we should we could see this mountain a little bit more and, and not have it just be this slight aside. 
but maybe not. Maybe that's fine. Diminished now, but unwavering, she steps lightly on, sylph-like, brandishing for stability, her parasol of history cherished. Yeah, just great descriptions there. Um, yeah. Annie Wilcox says, love the teetering with a tightrope walker. Yeah, there's great sounds, too. Um, Jenny Milton says, I love the directness of the title and the sense of character implied by personification, but I think the first stanza makes the reader work hard to place themselves in the events described. Interesting. Um, Sarah Horn says, there are some glorious descriptions in this poem. And Kevin Lemaster says, I got the meaning of Phenambulist with the following description. Yeah, for sure. Like, it definitely, um, you know what it means in context. Um, but you have to, you wonder as soon as you come to it. That's the thing. So, um, and, and, and wondering takes you out of the poem a little bit. Um, you know, because what you're trying to build is this, like, magical space where you're, like, living in someone else's breath and imagination you know and so anytime you come across a word that, that you don't know um that can pull you out a little bit and and sometimes it's worth it because it's a great word and you need it but but what do you gain by saying funambulist versus tightrope walker here it's not like we're repeating tightrope over and over again and and we you know um i don't think i don't think tightrope walker appear anywhere else in the poem so it's not like we're sort of avoiding you know, having to say things in a different way. Um, I think it's just, I think just tightrope walker is better. Um, but anyway, you know, landlocked, she once knew the brisk breath of the sea, the, you know, her parasol of history cherished. The, the, so this last stanza, the music that accompanies her performance wails, the years of pain and conquest. This is the first time that the, the rain didn't get as strong. The abstraction of years of pain and conquest um, is maybe a little, it just doesn't have the same concrete zing and zest as the rest of the poem. The years of pain and conquest of genocide, exile, diaspora. Um, what if it was just, maybe it's just the years of pain and conquest is too much. Um, what if it was the music that accompanies her performance, um, the pain of conquest? of genocide, exile, diaspora. Um, I think that would be a little tighter and better. But never mind, so we transition here. Um, she long ago mastered the arts of grace and purpose and endurance. And again, again, uh, here again, the grace and purpose and endurance is like too much in the similar way that the painting conquest is too much abstraction. It just doesn't have the, the, the grippingness, <laughs> if that's a word, the grippiness of the concrete really wonderful lines in the earlier poem the abstraction like like there's a distance and a lack of engagement in them but what if it was just so, so if you tighten that up you know but never mind she long ago mastered the art of endurance what if it was just that of balancing her longings or with strategic silence again the longings and strategic there's just so much abstraction in this last stanza that it doesn't stand out that there's pain there's conquest there's um um, there's grace, purpose, endurance, um, and longings. Like, that's all abstraction and, and strategic. I mean, those are all very abstract ways to go. And so, you know, I mean, there's nothing wrong with doing that, but it, it weakens the poem and doesn't make it as gripping. And so if you can, you know, what if it was just, um, what if the last stanza was just this? The music that accompanies her performance wails, um, the pain of conquest, of genocide. But never mind, she long ago mastered the art of endurance, of balancing her silence. Like, what if it was just that simple and got to it that quickly and we cut out the clutter of that abstraction? It, it, it's much stronger to me that way. Um, yeah, um, Katie Dutcher says at the point, the mountain. So we're going back to the arrow rat thing. Um, at the point the mountain and name almost starts to feel like a false door as use of the name makes me think that we are about to dive into the mountain more directly. Yeah, that was my sense too. So the naming here, I, I like the name because it's another detail um, that I'd, I, I'd sort of known at one point but forgotten. And so it's a really interesting fact that that was Mount Ararat. Um, and it, but I kind of wanted this to be separate. Like I wanted a period there and then Ararat doing something is a line. Um, is Ararat diminished now? 
No, I don't think so. It's not. It's the tightrope walker of the country. But but maybe something about you know Ararat. Describe it like a little bit, and so then we get we get to have that detail, which is nice, with um, um, with, without it being a little bit off, I guess. Let's see. Kim Vaughn says, I find unfamiliar words distracting unless the content defines them. For me, this poem accomplishes that. Um, they take a BL creates great metaphors. Um, Richard Westheimer says, it's interesting to hear you or your Tim struggle with pronouncing words. That, maybe that's just my, uh, my own thing, but he says... Uh, it brings up how important it is to use simpler, even single syllable words as much as possible. Um, yeah, there's just more power in that in, in most cases um, because uh, there's so many words that we, you know, you, very few people are reading things for the first time um, on a live stream, you know, and so you have to say them out loud. You have to make a guess. When you're reading, you can kind of just pick your own guess and go with it. Um, which is why so many people, there's so many words that we sort of have a way we pronounce, then like years later we find out that we've always been pronouncing them wrong in our heads. That's a very common thing. Um, and you can get away with it more when it's people reading to themselves. Um, but yeah, it is a good point. I mean, words like that, they're not as powerful as simpler language. They're just not. And, and Kim Vaughn says, I find unf unfamiliar words distracting. Unless the content defines them, for me, this poem accomplishes that. Um Clayton Clark says, no imagery in the last stanza loses me. Yeah. Um, that's what I was kind of getting at here. So maybe maybe what we need is to pull some more image back. I think Nate Jacob at some point mentioned, um, um, you know, extending the tightrope walking metaphor more. Maybe what we need is more uh, somehow getting some of that into here. I mean, there is the balancing. Um but but maybe we can we need to heighten that a little more just so it so it stays balanced within the poem too. Uh, maybe that's what's missing. So the last stanza is the only one, and and maybe maybe what it needs to be is is one long stanza and not have these breaks because the breaks sort of make you think that it, there's like a specific reason for breaking it that way, um, and you kind of makes you want balance. But maybe if we just get rid of these stanza breaks and pu pull this and tighten it up so that we wouldn't have all this abstraction here. And just a few lines, like I mentioned, you know, the music that accompanies her performance, wails, um, wails the pain of conquest, of genocide. But never mind, she long ago mastered the art of endurance, or maybe just she long ago mastered the art of balancing her silence, or something like that. Um, but maybe having that quickness there and, and having just be a, a tighter, more condensed poem is the way to go. But anyway, just great writing, though. I, I love um, so many aspects of this. Um, let's see. Yeah, Nate Jacobs says, BL creates great metaphors, for sure. Attractive Face says, very interesting and strong poem, enjoying listening to the others explain some of the words. I cannot be sure I would stay tuned if I had to look up so many words. I think this poem has something to reveal, but it needs to be uncovered. I'm sure in Ferrante, her music mastered the art of pain. Maybe ending. That's interesting. Yeah, maybe that could. Um, and Richard Westheimer too. And I think Nate Nate mentioned this maybe, but um, um, Noah's relationship with Ararat opens many doors to walk through, and maybe too many. Um, like Katie mentioned, maybe that's a false door. That's just there's so much baggage and so much just extra content included in. You know, it, there's so much religious. It is a sacred mountain. Um, hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I'm kind of. That's an interesting spot. I can't decide. I can't decide if you want to extend that or if you just want to cut it. I, it could go either way, I think. Um, Joe Booker says, could the author rework the last stanza? Yeah, that's the main thing, though. The poem is great. It just doesn't have the zing in the last stanza. Um, and... and uh, I think it was Sharon Ferrante says uh, maybe just the ending could be her music uh, mastered the art of pain or something like that is the ending after the cherished. That, that would be interesting. I mean, I think maybe it's just too long. Um, I think everyone's leaning toward just leaving Ararat off. Um, and just, but, but Sacred Mountain, do you wonder what that Sacred Mountain is until you mention it? And, but we have the arc though. So we kind of know if people know 
the story of the Ark, then we know it's Ararat. Maybe we just don't need the name. Yeah. Hmm. Anyway, yeah, but great writing all throughout. And and this critique's going on longer than it should, too. So, um, but good stuff. Thanks for sharing this. This is P.L. Pikes. Um, Armenia is only her stage name. Great title there. Another great title. Um, Global mustard shortage looms ahead of summer barbecues. Then we have two others. The State Street Santa Barbara. This is by Judith uh, uh, Fay. Um, State Street Santa Barbara, which um, just we wanted more of that story. And then my soap, that that lovely fun one, um, with the, with the meaning at the end, the heavierness to it behind it as well. My soap. Um, anyway, thanks. Great poems this week. Um, thanks everybody for sharing it. Thanks for the despite the. I wonder what YouTube's doing now. Is it still spinning? No, YouTube's back actually. So at some point YouTube came back. <laughs> Only two people are watching it there because everybody left. Um, but I'm really wondering if it recorded the whole thing and I'll have to, um, or I'll have to download U- Facebook's version and then upload it to YouTube later. But if I do, it will be there, um, as well. I'm kind of curious to see how it goes, but anyway, thanks so much. It was a great, uh, great fun today as it always is. I just love the critique of the week. Hope you do too. I mean, obviously you do cause you're here. So thanks for being here. Um, the, uh, Rattlecast coming up is going to be an interesting one. Um, next week's guest is going to be. Jill Ken, uh, Jill Kendall is how you'd say it. Jill Kendall, Radicast number one sixty one. Um, it's a she's a poet. We've published her twice as a poet, but she's mainly a nonfiction writer, which is one of the things I'm trying to branch out and have some some you know now that we've done one hundred and sixty episodes, you know it's it's more interesting when you can have people that come at poetry from different angles. And Jill Jill Kendall is mostly a fiction writer. She writes she's written I think three books of nonfiction. The most recent is this one, The Clean Daughter, a cross continental memoir about um, basically marrying somebody um, from another country and sort of trying to fit in with her family and then the, the history of that family and then they travel around the world. She spent years in a small remote village in Africa. Um, this is a really interesting life story of all the her journey, and that's what this book is about. Mostly about her um, father-in-law, who um, um, committed suicide assistedly through um, um, the laws there in the Netherlands. I think it is. Um, so that'll be an interesting topic as well. Um, the Clean Daughter is her book, but we have other poems too. So she's, she's going to read a passage from this, and then we'll talk about the content of it. But then she'll also read some poems that relate as well, because she writes poems too, even though it's not her primary mode of writing. So that'll be interesting. There's Relicast number 161. The um, prompt for this week was two. I should, I should have this up every time so I don't have to wait and look. The prompt was two. I'm sure everyone's going to say it even before I say it. I'll write a poem about a historical figure that most people don't know. That's the prompt for this week. Write a his- poem about a historical figure most people don't know. So we'll get to learn a lot about things. I love learning in poems. It's the best way to learn. Um, that'll be the prompt for this week. Rattlecast number 161 with Jill Kendall. The regular time, Monday, September 26th, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Hope to see you there. Hope you have a great weekend in the meantime, and I will talk to you soon. Goodbye. <laughs>